Welcome to the History of Glass program. Can everyone hear me okay? If you wanna just type like yes or no in the chat. Um, my name is Alyssa Holland. I'm a library associate here at the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Um, so before we get into it, I'd like to tell you also about an upcoming program that I think you all would be interested in. On Sunday, August 15th um, from one to two, Valerie will also be using art from the Museum of Art and Archaeology and the State Capitol Building in Jefferson City to illustrate how Missouri has been a central part of the history of the United States. Um, so also before we get started, just some Zoom etiquette housekeeping. So um, before I introduce today's presenter, um, I wanted to let you know that on your Zoom screen, if you hover or tap, you should see, among other things, a chat bubble icon. Um, if you have any questions during the program, you can type them in, in the chat and I'll be keeping an eye on them. And I can ask Valerie at the end of the session to answer them. Um, if you, at the end of the presentation, would like to use your microphone to ask a question, uh, you can use the raise hand tool, which is a little hand icon it lets you click to raise your hands like I did and I'll see that and then I can call on you. And <clears throat> I think that's about it. Does anyone have any questions? All right, well, in that case, um, Valerie Hammonds is a retired teacher of Latin American and world history. And now she is a docent at the Museum of Art and Archeology span at MU and Boone County Historical Museum and a tutor for Literacy Action Corps of Columbia. So welcome, Valerie. Thank you for being here today and learning about the history of glass from the beginnings to the modern times. I will cover the elements of glass, the beginnings of glass making in the Middle East, types of glass making, shapes of glass objects, the history of glass in Europe, Africa, and Asia, and a few modern glass makers. This is a relief plaque with the profiles of Saul and Gladys Weinberg. It is made by a local sculptor, Sabra Tol Meyer. And um, I put this on here because Saul and Gladys were archeologists and professors at MU and they began the, the uh, ancient collection uh, for the gallery. Gladys was very interested in ancient glass and her goal was to find an ancient glass factory, uh, which she did in some of her uh, excavations. So that's why the Museum of Art and Archaeology has so much glass in it. Glass in the world today. Look around you. What do you see? What is made of glass? The screen that you're staring at, your computer screen, your iPad, your laptop, whichever, whatever you're on, your cell phone, windows, your glasses, light bulbs. So many things are made out of glass. This is a slide of a broken window. It was um, a window that a mower broke uh, with a rock in our sunroom. And it's made out of tempered, double-paned glass. And I was out there in the sunroom when it happened and I heard and watched the, the glass crackle all the way uh, to the edges of it. I worried that it broke both panes, but it didn't. And now it's repaired. But I think it was interesting um, and kind of arty. The history of glassmaking is more than 4,000 years old. I have put in a couple of pages from a coloring book that is uh, on the history of glass, uh, just to give you something to look at as I tell the tale. Whenever you look at uh, or read about the history of glass, it will probably start with this story that a Roman writer, Pliny, told. It's about Phoenician sailors who camped on a beach and they were 
trying to protect their fire. So they use blocks of salt or natron, which was a mineral salt find, found on dried lake beds to protect the fire. And as it burned, it melted. Oops, a little touchy. Um, into the sand, uh, with the sand and became liquid glass. Now, this is an interesting story. It probably didn't happen. Glass needs a higher temperature at which to melt but um, it makes for an interesting story. What we will learn is that glass, early glass items were not transparent and their shapes resembled pottery that was made of clay. Objects that made of pottery where they were now making the same shape out of glass. Like today, we use plastic to imitate glass. There are three elements of glass. Two thirds is silica, which is sand or crushed quartz. 15% are the fluxes, the soda or potash, uh, that natron that we saw, that are the binding agents that lower the temperature with the silica will melt. And lime is the hardener, the stabilizer that makes glass strong and water resistant. Usual glass will have that Coke bottle greenish uh, color to it. And they learned that um, if, they, if they added different oxides, like iron oxide, it would make something brown. Cobalt oxide would make something blue. And if they added uh, some compounds, like sulfur would make it amber or brown. So we will see colors in the glass. This is a map I captured off of the internet um, to show you the origin of glass. It probably or originated here in Mesopotamia, which is a land between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, or Syria, or Egypt. All of them were very early in glass making. <clears throat> and they probably had some kind of glaze material from about 8,000 BC. But from the mid 2000 BC, the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians were able to make a glaze for stone beads using some form of kiln. These early glass objects may have been created by accident or a byproduct of metalworking, like in the copper industry, or during the production of faience, which is a pre glass material made in a similar process. Uh, to glazing, we'll talk about faience and look at some objects in a, in a bit. They made small objects such as beads that were imitating gems formed by casting. And most of the objects that we will see are um, in the uh, museum collection. And I always put a little uh, Museum of Art and Archaeology number uh, by, by it to show you that. Uh, this is a pendant made out of glass from the Hurrian civilization and they lived in Northern Mesopotamia. And this is from the 15th or 14th century BC. So it's about 3,500 years old. It's not very large, it's about two inches. And this is an Egyptian object made out of faience. It's called a New Year's flask for what was written on it in hieroglyphs. Fions is a vitreous material, it's glass-like, and it turns bright blue or green when fired. It's made of finely powdered quartz grains fused together with small amounts of lime and natron or plant ash. It can be molded by hand, it hardens with firing, and it's similar to glass but glass is formed by completely fusing the ingredients in a liquid melted at a high temperature. So it's similar, but different. And this is the Greek arabalos, which is a, a vessel for oil, and it can fit in, your, in your, the palm of your hand. It's very small, and this is made out of faience. And then the, the museum also has an arabalos made out of glass. 
and it's blue glass and it has this yellow trails added to it and worked. It's again, very small, two or three inches tall. One way they made glass was core formed. From about 1500 BC to the invention of glass blowing, the process of form, core formed glass existed to make small brightly colored vessels for perfumes or oils, like we've seen. This process was very labor intensive and costly, so only the very wealthy could afford them. This technique was probably invented in Mesopotamia and moved to Egypt, Greece, and elsewhere, where it was employed and flourished between 1500 and 1100 BC. And again, this is a, a picture from the coloring book, The Story of Glass. This shows how you core form glass. Um, it's made by taking a rod and putting a, um, a core like made out of clay and dung around the end of the rod in the shape that you want the vessel. And then another person takes trails of glass and wraps it around. And then you smooth it or marver it or trail, make little indentations in it. And when the glass is cooled, you hollow out the inside from that core. It's rough on the inside and smooth on the outside. Again, a small vessel and uh, labor intensive. This is an alabastron uh, from Greece. It's core formed glass and they've done a little trail work on the outside of it. The original vessels made in this shape were made from alabaster. So that's where we get the name alabastron. So this is Greek. And uh, this is another one that was core formed, a little bit different shape. It was a little bit later. So that was one way to make glass vessels. Another way was casting glass. Several casting techniques developed in the 15th century BC in the Near East and Egypt. These techniques had only limited uses until the Hellenistic period, when a demand for luxury goods centered around the royal courts found, founded by the successors of Alexander the Great. And this is a piece that the museum has. It's a diadem that is uh, core formed, or ca I'm sorry, cast. And the beads were cast in open molds where the design is carved in taglio. It imitates hair in the form of bangs and acts like a headband. Thousands of objects like these were found in the late Bronze Age. Sites in Greece attest to the popularity of glass as a medium for jewelry. In the ancient world, glass was considered a precious metal. The bottom photo is from Roman London dump called Cullet of broken glass vessels. You can see down here. The glassmakers added Cullet to a batch of raw materials or frit to help these dissolve and speed up the melting process. When freshly made raw glass was in short supply, Cullet may have been the main source of glass working. And this diadem was originally this color. And we'll talk about what happens with the aging in a little bit. Obviously the color changes. This is an amulet in the form of a double-sided bearded head. It's cast glass and it, you can see the double side of the beard. It's Carthaginian, which is Northern Africa. And this piece is just I think absolutely stunning. It's a gold leaf sandwich glass bowl. Elegant bowls such as this one were made by the fusion of two clear glass vessels with a delicate pattern of gold leaf inserted between them. Such opulent vessels would have adorned the tables of the elite or were perhaps used in religious rituals. 
in the practical use, they probably served as drinking cups that would have had stands or they were held by cup bearers at dinner parties. This is a very unusual piece and sometimes it's out on loan uh, for exhibits and other museums. This is a piece from Egypt, it's a mummy mask that is made out of plaster, it's painted, but the eyes are glass. I wanted to show you something that's made out of rock crystal. When you see this, you go, oh, it's glass, but no, it isn't. Rock crystal is a colorless quartz. It's a hard stone. And because of this hardness, it can be highly polished and will not easily scratch. It is a difficult stone to work with, but craftsmen have been carving vessels from rock crystal since before the middle of the second millennium BC. So it's called an amphoriscus. The invention of glass blowing was a deal changer in the ancient world. This is another way of making glass. It was probably invented by craftsmen in Syria in the first century BC. This process simplified and cheapened the production of glass. Now everyday vessels could be made cheaply at first, glass was blown into molds, but soon the blowers made various shapes without the use of molds. And hopefully most of us have seen glass blowing today, which is pretty much the same way they did it 2000 years ago. Um, this is a uh, mold blown glass, which is about 2000 years old. It's called a knobbed beaker and it's Roman. And this is called an ovoid unguentarium. It's from the first century BC to first century AD. It's made out of glass. It's color band glass. It belongs to a traditional period where the blowing replaced the casting as the most common method of forming glass vessels. To make this, the maker arranged a series of colored canes of glass into the desires pat desired pattern and fuse them together. The fuse mass would then be heated again and cast or manipulated into a form that could be picked up by the blowpipe, heated again, inflated, and finally uh, using a shaping tool uh, to get it the shape that they wanted. So very colorful, not very big. This is probably about six inches tall. And this is a free blown glass vessel that has applied trails to it. And the um, trails are here for the handle and uh, the little things along the side. And uh, the uh, foot of it would have been applied too. And we'll talk about the iridescent quality in just a minute. And this to me is so delicate. It's a riton, which is like a ceremonial vessel. It's in the shape of a horned animal. They don't know what kind of animal it is. It is open on either end. And so it's probably used in religious uh, service to pour a libation. And a lot of these pieces were probably found in graves and that's why they're in such good shape. Here we have a square bottle, it's Roman. It's made out of glass and it has the glass maker's name on it, which I think is really special. His name was Theodorus and it appears in Greek letters on the bottom. And there was a um, article in the Muse magazine journal that the museum puts out uh, about this and so this is the view of the bottom and then you have his name just a drawing of it with the Theodorus around it. Very unusual. This is cameo glass and I know it's just two little pieces but 
um, I think it's probably the most special glass that the museum has because um, of uh, the limited uh, time that cameo glass was made. The Romans were known for their cameo glass. It was a luxury form of glass art made by fusing layers of different colored glass to produce designs. Usually white opaque glass figures and motifs on dark colored background uh, were fused together and then the layers were gently carved. It was first seen in ancient Roman art about 30 BC. Previous method was, you, was using semi-precious gravestone, gemstones like onyx and agate, but glass, you, doing this out of glass allowed consistent predictable colored layers where the gemstones did not. It was produced from about 30 BC to 60 AD, so very limited. And then again, in the th late third century during the period of Constantine the Great and his sons. And then it was not perfected again until the 19th century by the English. So it's very labor intensive, very expensive. Now these two pieces might have been from a vase that, that looked like this. And this is blue glass Amphiscorus, Amphoriscus, sorry, with cupids that they found in Pompeii and notice it's on a stand. And it has little cupids on it with the flowers. There is a vase called the Portland vase that is in the British Museum today. It's uh, Roman and it's a very important vase I'm trying to give you some ideas of the uh, decorations on it. No one has decided on the scenes on this vase. There's a, a wonderful book called The Portland Vase by Robin Brooks. And it takes a reader on the history, the journey of this vase through time. Unfortunately, at 3.45 p.m. on February 7th, 1845, William Lloyd shattered the vase in its vitrine in the British Museum. It was put back together, but there were 37 small fragments left over. In 1948, the restoration was yellowing and needed to be restored and they were only able to replace three of those 37 fragments. And in 1988, the adhesive was yellowing again and brittle. So the restorers chose a, a, an epoxy resin with excellent aging properties and were able to use most of the fragments and fill in the gaps with blue or white resin. So if you're ever in London at the British Museum, take a, a peek at this nine inch tall vase. And it's called the Portland vase because of a family that owned it. And I think that was right before the, um, it was given to the British Museum. Glass mirrors. Did Romans, or the Romans knew how to make glass mirrors, but they preferred metal. Glass ones were generally coated with tin ore or silver. Also use of glass to magnify objects was known. A little glass ball filled with water may have been used for fine work, such as engraving gems, but the Romans did not develop lenses, prisms, or spectacles. And this is a Roman uh, mirror that's in the museum. It's a mirror with a repos reposé relief showing Paris uh, with a cupid on oops, Mount Ida. It's made out of bronze, tins, and gilding. So the other side would have been polished to use as a mirror. The use of magnif to magnify objects was known very early. Nimrod lens was not unusual. It's a piece of 3000 year old oval rock crystal, not glass, but rock crystal. It was ground and polished with one side plane and one slightly convex. 
It's been regarded as an optical lens, but would have been of little or no practical use. And this is the Nimrod lens named for the palace where it was found. Several hundred of these have been found. The earliest dates to Egypt in 4500 BC. Roman authors Pliny and Seneca refer to a lens used by an engraver in Pompeii. These could magnify one and a half to two times. Some are made of glass, some are rock crystal. Seneca, uh, a Roman author, is said to have used a glass globe of water as a magnifier to read, quote, all the books in Rome, end quote. And we have monks in the Middle Ages that may have used glass to read. And this is a mural uh, from the uh, chapter house uh, where monks lived in a city that was north of Venice. And you have this monk with glasses on. This was painted, the mural was painted in 1352. Um, most historians believe that the first form of glasses was produced in Italy around 1285 to 1289. They were two small magnifying glasses and set in bone, metal, or leather mountings that could be balanced on the bridge of the nose. So that's what he's doing. There's no uh, arms there to keep them on. And on the same mural, we have the earliest depiction of a person using a magnifying glass from the 13th century. So when you are in museums looking at paintings, you should keep your eye out for glasses. This is at the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. I always love to go look at this painting. It's of St. Jerome who lived um, from, well, in the uh, fourth century AD. He's a cardinal and one of the church uh, fathers of the Christian church. And he translated the Bible into Latin. Um, and it shows him here with a uh, well-studied book uh, with glasses, but this was not, sorry, my mouse is just kind of touchy. Um, but this is not a something that would have happened in the fourth century, uh, more likely 1630s by the Dutch artist. Did Romans use window glass? It's a, it's a good question and I've kind of looked at it, but they did not use window glass um, in Italy uh, very often probably because of the climate and also the way that they made their houses. This is a plan of a house in Pompeii and you can see that the windows are kind of high and they're small. And the house centers around the inner courtyard. And uh, probably they were uh, small and high for safety reasons too. There is some evidence in Pompeii that there were some windows, were some, was some window glass, but uh, there just wasn't much. And this is a house in Pompeii, house of the Kei, uh, to show you how high the windows are. Because if you look at this door, you can see how high they were. But the Roman Empire extended north to England and glassmakers in England have thought about this because it's a colder climate. They probably had glass in England and they ex explored a couple of different ways the Romans could have made window panes. One way was cast glass and produces a pane of uneven thickness as you can see there. It's fire polished, which makes it glossy on one side and a matted pitted finish on the other. It took practice for these glassmakers, but they feel that the Romans could have mass produced this form. 
So you can see that it would have um, allowed light in and some protection from the cold, but you couldn't see much on uh, the outside through it. So we're going to talk about early medieval Europe from 500 to 1200. After the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, there was no central government. During this time, the centers of Roman glassmaking moved up into Germany, Northern France, and England. There still was some in Italy, but not as much. The original areas of glassmaking in Syria, Egypt, and the Eastern Empire continued with this craft. But the making of glass changed and new styles emerged. Christian churches were using glass in their windows. In the Eastern Mediterranean, the Byzantine Empire flourished and we're going to look at some pieces from the Byzantine Empire. This is a square jug with pattern blown decoration. And the iridescence on this and pieces that we've seen is caused by aging, weathering, and contaminants in the soil. So if it was buried in the soil, it's going to hurt the glass as it ages. And we also have an octagonal jug that's Byzantine. And on the, uh, at the sides, there is a drawing. A little different depending on the size. And one of my favorite pieces is this bracelet. It's made out of glass and it has enamel paint on it. I can't think that it was probably used that much. It look, it, when you see it in person, it looks heavy because it's so thick. Um, this is just a uh, drawing that I found in a book about uh, glass making furnaces in the Middle Ages. This is the elevation of the furnace. This is looking inside that to see where the pieces were placed as they were fired. And then this is it covered and the glass makers working. Um, this is a uh, detail from an unattributed engraving showing the island of Murano. Here's this Venice here, and this is Mur Murano, which is several islands. In the eighth, by the eighth century, the city of Venice had emerged as a major glass making manufacturing center. The Venetian city state grew during the decline of the Roman Empire as people fled barbarian invasions to the safety of islands. The Venetian Lagoon was such a small community and became highly successful trading port between Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Treasures came through Venice, including glass. The original Venetian glassmakers were joined by glassmakers from Byzantium and the Middle East, enriching their glassmaking knowledge. It became very important to the economy, so the glass workers were forbidden to divulge their trade secrets. They could not leave the island of Murano once they were moved there without permission. And if a worker left and did not return, his family would be imprisoned. If he still did not return, they would send an assassin to kill him. They did not want those secrets out. By the end of the 13th century, most of Venice's glassmaking industry was confined to this island of Murano. This is a, a um, drawing of a doge visiting glass factories in Mur Murano. It's a doge is a chief magistrate in Venice or Genoa. Although the glassmakers could not leave Murano, the nobles could, they were free to come and go. But the glassmakers had privileges like not working during the hot summer when the furnaces were repaired and they built up stocks of fuel and raw materials for the next season. 
the glassmakers enjoyed high social status. When their daughters married noblemen, their children were considered noble. And also changes came from the East. The Mongolian warlord Timur the Great in 1400 destroyed the city of Damascus, which was a great class center. And this may have led to an influx of craftsmen into Italy and also with the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453, it might have caused many craftsmen to flee to Italy. There were many innovations, such as Murano beads, Cristallo, chandeliers, and mirrors at this time. And this is an early example of Venetian Cristallo glass. It was made to imitate that natural rock crystal. And uh, this glass dates from about 1580 AD, but they probably um, started making it about 1409. It was thin, almost weightless, free from flaws and colorless. And the workers could create elegant, intricate forms. Uh, but this kind of glass was unstable and it's a miracle that any of it has survived. And this just shows you some more uh, glass from Murano. Uh, this is a Cristallo stem glass with enamel painting on it. Some Mille Fiori trading beads, and that means many flowers, and a Murano vase from about 1600. I put this map of trade routes on here to talk about what was happening in the 15th century with the age of exploration. The Portuguese started sailing, sorry, around the Cape of Good Hope, and that made the trade routes across Africa obsolete. And uh, man-made glass was unknown. Oops in many areas of the world. So glass beads were a lucrative trading commodity, especially in Africa and North America. Merchants made vast profits trading glass beads, metal beads, and porcelain beads. The golden, golden age for glass bead production was the 16th to the 18th century. And glass factories started expanding outside of Venice to the whole Republic because it, in 1525, there were only 24 glassworks factories in Venice, and by 1606, it grew to 251, so they just couldn't handle all of, all of it. And these are some glass beads. It has a long history in trade with Africa, between Africa and Europe. Um, the Africans were impressed with the glass beads, and much of the trading was with West Africa, for gold, ivory, palm oil, and other goods. In the late 19th and early 20th century, these beads were mostly made in Murano. It was a slow operation because letters would arrive by boat requesting the beads, a quote was sent back, and funds were transferred. This could take five or six months to complete. For the West Africans who did not deal in currency, the beads were shown as status in their community and ceremonial dress. Eventually, there were glassmaking factories in West Africa. And in the um, museum, there are several statues from Africa of the 20th century mainly. They're made out of wood, cowlin, and glass beads. And you notice on this female shrine figure, she has glass beads around her neck, around her wrists, and around her legs. So look closely at statues when you, when you see them. Also, trade had gone on between Europe and uh, China over the Silk Route for hundreds of years before that. Very slow, constant changing from merchant to merchant, which would increase the price, but um, because of the exploration, 
uh, glass making techniques spread to the East, to Asia, and were known in China. Um, much of Eurasia had a common knowledge base of how to make colored glass for the same purposes of glazing pottery, jewelry, and containers. And the museum has this snuff bottle from the 20th century. It's made out of glass. It held snuff, which was a form of smokeless tobacco that was snorted through the nose. The Jesuits introduced snuff to the Chinese court in the 17th century. It soon became common among uh, the courtiers, landlords, and wealthy merchants, and was mainly an upper class habit. The Chinese believed that snuff had medicinal qualities and snuff bottles became popular objects in the 18th and 19th century. Let's go back to Europe for a little bit. Um, this is a painting that the museum acquired in 2015. It's called Still Life with a Meat Pie. You can see the meat pie here the Nautilus goblet, silver plates, and glassware. It's Flemish. Um, it's contributed to Cornelius Mayhew. It depicts a partially draped table with different kinds of fine drinking glasses. The Nautilus cup, which is on its side, it's shaped like the um, shell found in the West Pacific. And Reimer, which is a large drinking glass that's studded to ensure a good grip, usually green in color. Um, that skill of making this kind of glass may go back as early as the third century. And they were made by glass workers along the Rhine River. And then this is a Taza glass. It has wide, shallow saucer-like dish mounted on a stem and it's for liquids or small foods. Uh, this is a, a still life. It's a table that shows a meal that may have been interrupted. And this plate, kind of hanging off the edge, counterbalance, oops, um, to connote the transience of fortune and pleasure. And it's also an indirect reference to Dutch trade in the East. And also in Europe, let's go to Spain in the 17th century. This is a glass chalice or goblet. It's too large for really being a wine glass. The rim is splayed to form a lip, so probably used for a liquid other than wine. It was possibly a loving cup that would have been hand, uh, passed from hand to hand. It's transparent green glass. It's a glossy surface and the foot of it is hollow, blown, and they were um, connected later, the foot and the main glass. It has a simple decoration formed around a bowl by trailing two cords of dark brown glass and pinching them together to create a chain of oval links. Let's look at stained glass. 1100 to 1500, stained glass is one of the foremost types of painting in Europe. Look closely in an edge from the, from an image from the period to see the painting done on each figure. Stained glass inspired the lives of the faithful through religious narratives in churches, cities and city halls and private homes um, because most of the people were illiterate in Europe at this point, and so they were telling the story, the Bible stories, especially in the churches, on the glass. Another page from the coloring book. This is a um, medieval stained glass worker in his shop, and you can see some of the images that he has created, his tools and uh, working on some stained glass. The term stained glass comes from the silver stain that was often applied to the side of a window that would face the outside of the building. When the glass was fired, the silver stain 
turned a yellow color that can range from lemon to gold and the light would shine through the painting on the window. Today's stained glass is basically made the same way it was a thousand years ago. And you can um, take lessons now in, in making stained glass. Uh, it's kind of fun to do. A very old cathedral in Augsburg, Bavaria, Germany, uh, was started in the 11th century and added to in the 13th, 14th century, the 1300s. And you can see the stained glass that, that is there. It's among the oldest stained glass in the world. Each piece of glass is a color with its dividing lead strip. And I'm giving you a close up of one of the windows of Prophet Jonas to show this. Um, many people, many pieces had, had um, colored paint added to it uh, for details on the face, like you see the eyes, clothing or ornamentation. The paint had tiny pieces of glass in it, would be fired again um, to adhere the paint to the original glass. And this shows you uh, the wall where uh, the prophet is with others. In Shark Cathedral, just an outside view of, of the cathedral, it was begun in 1145 when the style was Romanesque and it was continued at 1194 when it was more Gothic. And one of the interesting things I find about cathedrals when they only finish one spire and then they start another one years later, they have no um, uh, problem uh, with making the new spire different. But in Shark Cathedral, you have the um, uh, wonderful walls of stained glass up here in the clerestory. And this was um, a view after the restoration in 2017. So just beautiful, beautiful wall of glass. And that's why you need the flying buttresses on the outside to hold up those walls. And this is a detail of the Blue Virgin a stained glass window from the south aisle of the choir. Um, this shows uh, the Virgin Mary from the 12th century panels. You can tell that because it has a red background and then they um, rescued it from the Romanesque church that burned down in 1194. And they had to add some panels with the blue in the back in order to bring the old window to the same dimensions that they needed for the new. Uh, the museum has a small quadrifoil from a window, probably French from 13th century. It has three colors of glass that have been painted and the paint was fired on. And then you have the lead around that. Um, last May, there was an uh, uh, article in the paper about a new exhibit being opened in the Corning Museum of Glass. The title was In Sparkling Company, Glass and the Cost of Social Life in Britain in the 1700s. So this exhibit looks at the etiquette and styles that new forms of glass inspired among the period's elite. And they even recreated the sugar retreats popular at the time in glass. Plus glass was used in fashion. This is a waistcoat, sorry, a, a man's waistcoat with glass stones in it, little glass stones. And also in the exhibit are some Venetian glass trading beads. Let's look real quickly at Louis Comfort Tiffany, a fairly modern glass maker, he was attracted to the rustic nature of ancient glass, a quality that contemporary glass artists rejected. Tiffany liked it. He thought the imperfections were beautiful and eye-catching. 
The rich tones were due in part to the use of pot metal full of impurities and in part due, due to the uneven thickness of glass, but mostly the ancient glassmaker did not use paint. Tiffany founded his own glass factory in Queens, New York, and he strived to create colorful pieces without the use of paint or enamel. To achieve this, he developed two important innovations, favoral glass and copper foil technique. And with the favoral glass, he achieved that iridescent glass of the past by mixing different colored glass together while hot. So he liked that iridescent look. And also he used it in his windows. Um, this is magnolias and irises. He made the stained glass windows, but he uh, did not like the thick lead rods that were soldered at their joints. And um, what he created were thin, flexible copper foil that discreetly connected the panes of glass with the, without the heavy or conspicuous joints. And he also um, is known for stained glass lamps handcrafted by a team of over 300 artisans. But until recently, it was thought that he was behind these pieces, but it's been proven that the artist who worked for him named Clara Driscoll was actually the brains behind the designs. A book, Clara and Mr. Tiffany, a novel by Susan Freeland is very uh, wonderful read about this. And um, in the museum, we have the, uh, we always call it the glass dress, but the name of it is Sleep by modern sculptor, Karen Lamont. And she, she would mold, um, take a mold of the human body and the surface of the garment and combine them. And she felt the hollow space that remained between them um, would illuminate the contours and curves of the human body. So that, and if you're ever at um, Crystal Bridges, one of her pieces is there called Dress Impression with oops, Wrinkled Cowl up there. That was fun to see that. And the last one is Dale Chihuly, who's an American sculptor. Um, the museum has several of his pieces from the Persian series. They have gently fluted edges, centrally shaped forms, and a wave of opulent jewel-like colors. So this one is called Lime Persian Single with Vermilion Lip Wrap. That vermilion that just pops out. And it's fairly large. And then you have these small ones. Um, one is the Tango Red, Radiant Persian Pear, and Parrot Green Persian. So, end of PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, we have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, Joe would like to know how long you've been doing this. Um, by this, I mean, like, I'm guessing studying history. Um, well, I taught history for uh, quite a few years, always been interested in, in that. And um, love being a docent at the, at the museum because I can apply that information I know from, from history to the pieces that are in the museum. So, and I'm very interested in glasses, you can tell. And um, we also had another person ask, um, so going back closer to the beginning of your presentation with the Portland vase, how it got shattered, mm -hmm. um, they wanna know, did the person who shattered it do it on purpose or ac on accident and how did that happen? Which is a really good question. <laughs> it's it's a wonderful, and that that book uh, is very fun to read. Um, yes, he did it on person. From what I remember, think um, he uh, 
might have been drunk at the time or somehow mad and just took his cane and, and whacked the vitrine and boom, it happened. And I think um, uh, he ended up being fined or something. It just <laughs> remarkable for destroying something that was so precious. And it's just remarkable to see how they can put it back together. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That is, I, I really thought it was going to be an accident. <laughs> That's a rough day at work right there. Um, are there any other questions? Um, either you can type it in the chat or if you click the raise hand button, they can call on you. All right, well, thank you. Oh, yeah, this is a fun fun talk to do and I thank you for, uh, for listening and, and sharing your Sunday afternoon with us. Well, we're really grateful to you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, so the Missouri Museum galleries are closed right now for art and archaeology as they're moving to a new location down to the Lower East level of Ellis Library. Yes. But it's hoped that they'll reopen in spring or summer of 2022. Yes. Um, in the meantime, you can also visit their website, which I'll put in the chat for more details. It's maa.missouri.edu. And if you want to check out recordings of past library events, you can do so on our events page, which is dbrl.org slash events, which I will also put in the chat. Um, and today's program has also been recorded and it will be added to the library's YouTube channel once um, it's linked from our events page and the PR team does its editing magic. Although um, your chats and your presence will not be recorded. So um, don't worry about that. But um, other than that, thank you all so much for coming and enjoy the rest of your day.